Hello, good afternoon and good evening everyone from wherever you're joining us today. I'm Valeria Rumori, the Director of the Italian Culture Institute in Los Angeles, and I would like to welcome you all to this exclusive pre-opening of the 20th Italian Language in the World Week with an exceptional guest. I would like to thank Beppe Sivagnini, who distinguishes himself for his generous availability to the Institute's passionate and unchanged throughout the years, and for being one of the most loved Italian writers and journalists in Italy and abroad. Cremasco, Bergamasco, Milanese d'adozione, Lombardo di famiglia, Italiano di cuore, Europeo convinto, appassionato del mondo. Crema, Bergamo e Milanese, Lombard by family adoption, Italian at heart, convinced European, impassionate by the world. The only person able to sum up Italy and his love for our country in one single sentence to Americans. No tell, no paradise. A fascinating purgatory of rowdy souls, each one convinced is special. Maybe it's a special way to anticipate also the 700th anniversary of Dante for next year's Italian language in the World Week. That says quite a great deal about Beppe whose presentation I will lead to our Consul General, Silvia Chiave, who enthusiastically accepted our invitation to open the 20th edition of the Italian Language Week. Beppe Severnini is really a pleasure friend to us, above all for those abroad and Italian cultural institutes all over the world, given is a forerunner and founder of the blog, Italians at Corriere della Sera. Capable to bring out and gather Italians abroad, even the most resistant ones from the East and West. And with his famous pizzas, he is like a Pied Piper, able to speak a language everyone understands. We find ourselves after a long journey that started almost two decades ago with him as a guest in Rome at the Ministry for the very first edition of the Week of the Italian Language in the World. We find each other today in these extraordinary and challenging times with Beppe, who I consider a very special travel companion through the years, and we do. We have had very many wonderful presentations, even audacious ones, uh, such as the French one, at the Institute in Marseille, I uh, hope you remember that, but with La Testa degli Italiani, the Italian Mind, in 2010, with the University of Aix in Provence, and in San Francisco in 2006, with La Bella Figura, Field Guide to the Italian Mind, and also later for Italians, Il Giro del Mondo in Ottanta Pizze, where he invited the Italians in Silicon Valley to meet for one of his famous pizzas. After 10 years, we meet again today to inaugurate this 20th edition of the Italian Language in the World Week. And with this world premiere of, his, of the English translation of his most recent book, The New Italians, published in September in Italy and superbly translated by Tony Schubert, who I would like to thank and who collaborates very actively with the Institute. So the presentation will work like this today. The Council General will give a few remarks, followed by Severnini's discussion with translator Tony Schubert. And afterwards, there will be a Q&A with the public. We invite you all to discuss with Severnini his 50 reasons for being Italian in the second part of the presentation using the Q&A function of Zoom. Now, without any further ado, I would like to give a very Truly, our thrilled thanks to Beppe Serenini for accepting our invite with enthusiasm and Tony Sugar for being here with us today. And the Consul General, of course, warmly accepted our invitation to open the Italian Language Week in the world and this very special occasion to present Beppe Serenini to Los Angeles. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, Valeria. Beppe for being here and welcome, everybody. I've had the chance to meet uh, Beppe Severgnini more than 15 years ago in India, where he was for a conference. At that time, I was a young diplomat at my first assignment abroad, 
whereas he was a star. He was already an acclaimed journalist, editor and columnist of Corriere della Sera, that is one of our main national newspapers. He had written for the Financial Times. He was Italian correspondent for The Economist. And he had already founded a blog called Italians, when blogs were not so common, where he had proved to be one of the most acute, keenest and sharpest interpreters and observers of the Italian nature. That's why I'm particularly glad to have him here uh, today for this uh, uh, celebration of the World Week of Italian Language. Uh, uh, even if only virtually, but only for the uh, COVID situation, because as Valeria already pointed out, uh, Beppe travels a lot. Last year, he could be in person uh, for the same occasion. Uh, he did a big tour in China, for example. So it's, his presence is particularly appropriate. You might know that this um, uh, week's uh, theme is the cartoons uh, and, of course, the Italian language. Beppe, among the 17 books he's written, has also written on Italian language, a very funny book on lessons of it for Italians. And those of us who have a cartoon culture might also see in Beppe Severnini uh, style a kind of cartoony label in the way he projects images and also in the way he likes to portray uh, uh, himself. Now, the book we're presenting today in a world preview for the English uh, edition, New Italian, uh, New Italians, 50 uh, Good Reasons to Be, uh, to be Italians, uh, is a book written about um, how the COVID crisis in some ways reshaped and reconfigured some of our identity and some of our characteristics and our, uh, and our identity. It's been written brashly in the heat of the moment and from the very epicenter of the crisis in Italy because uh, Beppe is from Crema. He was in Crema when he witnessed uh, all, all that was going on. It was a very dramatic moment for, for Italy. That's probably why even though he never loses his proverbial irony and sense of humor. Uh, Beppe in this book makes a deeper portrayal made of lights and shadows of, uh, of, uh, our, of uh, how our vices and virtues that emerge with this, uh, with, this, uh, with this crisis. And that's why maybe the book has a slightly more dramatic cut, but it's the cut due to actuality and due to the real times we're going through. Because the book is out in Italy, but unfortunately we're still not out of the pandemics. Uh, as always, Beppe does also a great job in adjusting stereotypes um, and he knows very well how to speak to foreigners and how to speak to Americans. He knows how you Americans love us but still somehow not always understand us fully. And he knows how to speak to foreigners because he's been foreign correspondent from London, from Moscow, from Washington, D.C. He's collaborated, among others, with universities like the MIT and Oxford University, not to name the Italian ones. And he's written American bestsellers like Ciao America and La Bella Figura, for example. So he knows, he knows his public very well. He knows how to focus on his public very well. Now, um, another thing I wanted to say about the book, I want to quote Beppe when Beppe says uh, in the introduction that he's trying to make a honest and affectionate analysis. And Tony, you will forgive me if the translation is not accurate, but um, I think it perfectly adheres to how uh, Beppe is perceived by us when he speaks with this affection about uh, Italians. And I uh, also want to be affectionate and honest when I say that uh, uh, Beppe Severnini in these years has been and still is one of the most powerful and effective ambassadors for Italy in the world. So, and I'm not the only one to think this because uh, uh, Beppe has been awarded uh, of one, with one of our uh, highest decoration, Commendatore of the Order of Merit uh, of the Italian Republic by our president. Well, he's also an uh, officer of the British Empire named by Queen Elizabeth II, but that's another story. So now I'm sure that you're much looking forward to hearing from him, that you're looking forward to uh, reading his book. Uh, so thank you, Beppe, again, very warmly for being here. Benvenuti a tutti and have a nice webinar. Thank you. Uh, well, what can I say? Is, um, it's, um, it's difficult. First of all, let me say, uh, buongiorno America uh, uh, and good afternoon California. Uh, but after such a, 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 a passionate and friendly introduction, 
of course, don't believe Silvia and Valeria. We've known each other for a long time. They're much younger than me, of course, but they know me and, they, and they've been too far too kind. I'm not that spectacular sort of journalist or writer that they describe, but thank you anyway. You know, when your hair is, turns white, you become more sensitive and you appreciate more of these compliments, so thank you. Uh, it's, um, I, it just occurred to me just now that 20 years ago, exactly 20 years ago, I was in LA. I was in LA following the 2000 elections. And I remember we had a pizza on election night thinking that this bunch of Italians, lots of Italians living in LA would watch and you know, leave the pizzeria with a new president. In fact, as you all know, in 2000, we, it didn't happen. And we thought, this is a very strange time for America. Uh, and and this, we'll never see another election as, as surprising as this one. Well, we, we're now in America seeing strange times and an important election and one is coming up, but it's nice to be, to be, to be, to be back at least uh, sort of in this way with a webinar. I love to be back in Los Angeles, another pizzeria and watch the next election. But this is not what we're gonna talk about tonight. So not about American politics. Of course, if you write in the Q&A something about America, I'm, I think I will try to answer, but this is not what we're here for. We're here for to celebrate the Italian language and uh, in this 20th uh, edition, I was in South America in the early 2000s. I was in India, I was in Moscow, I was in every year I try to help out if I can. And uh, so this sort of round figure 20 is important and I, it's great to be here. Um, and uh, I suggest we proceed like that. First of all, I want you to introduce um, a, a man from California. Uh, I'm proud to introduce him as my translator, but he's translating only one of my books into English. Uh, and uh, the book is Off the Rails, came out last year, 2019. And, uh, and uh, he, and he translated a lot of real superstar of Italian literature and fiction. So, uh, of course, he'll say that he's flattered and happy to translate me, but it's not true. He really is a translator of the best Italian uh, writers. And I'm happy to introduce now Tony Sugar, who happens to be in California. And uh, what I will do is I'll ask him like two or three questions just to warm up. Uh, this will, this section will last sort of 20, no less than that, let's say 10, 12 minutes. And then I'll, uh, I'll, we'll go into my books. And uh, that means talking about Italy. Uh, Tony, give me another minute. The reason why I wrote Neo Italiani, which uh, is, I hope, will be translated uh, into, into English soon in Italy just came out. It was like mid-September. It's like I tried already, uh, when was that, 15 years ago, to write a national portrait. In Italian, it was called La Testa degli Italiani, and in, in, in America, it became a bestseller, actually a New York Times bestseller. You can see it behind me. It was La Bella Figura, that's a translation of La Testa degli Italiani. And I, from that moment, from 2005 in Italy, 2006 in America, that's when La Bella Fiumara came out, I knew I had to attempt another national portrait. And when you do this, you, you, it's, it's a mirror for your own countryman, in a way, a mirror you hold up so you can see yourself in, in there. But it's also a way to introduce yourself and your country to our foreign friends. And of course, we have many in America, we have many elsewhere. This book has been translated into 14 languages. The translator at the time was another superb Italian translator, Giles Watson. He's not with us anymore, unfortunately. And he only translated me and, and white wines from the, the, the Trieste region for some reason. That's it. And, and Giles did a tremendous job as well. From that time, 2015 years, I, I knew that I had to try again, but I didn't really know whether 
it made sense. I mean, does the world need another Beppe Severini portrait of Italy? I wasn't really sure. But then the pandemic happened and it happened first in Italy. We were the first country outside Asia to, to test this. We were the first democracy in the world, together with South Korea, to try uh, to, to test and, and, and be challenged by this. And the, I'm talking to you from Crema. I was in Milan just now, but I drove back. And Crema, Codogno, Bergamo, Brescia, we were really the epicenter of it all. And we saw that happen. And I, I write for the New York Times every month or so, and I wrote two or three pieces saying why Italy is coping, uh, coped and will keep coping. And, and then I, the book, in a way, wrote it itself. It's not a book about a lockdown. It's not a book, a, a book about coronavirus. But it's, it's a book that, that sort of stems from here. A crisis and a pandemic is a gigantic crisis. We know in Italy, we, you know in the United States, our friends in France and Germany and England and Britain know. Is a, is, a, is a crisis, which unfortunately is not over yet. As you know, in Italy, things are not, we're doing be, still better than elsewhere in Europe, but today and yesterday news are not too encouraging. A crisis and a pandemic is like a lie detector. It, you, you can bluff your way for a week or a month, but you, can, you, you see the truth about people, about relations, about communities and about nations. And I think the pandemic was like a big lens through which I could see my own country better. And I decided that actually Italians were doing well. I knew from the very beginning we would do well and react in a strange way. We'll go into that later. In a strange, unexpected way. And I knew we would surprise everyone. I remember an interview with NPR in the States. And my interviewer was kind of, uh, wasn't really convinced. This Italian, you are not disciplined. You are a little anarchic and artistic. You won't really stick to the rules. And I say, first of all, we have a national, something called National Health Service, which helps. And second, uh, we're gonna surprise you because Italians are worried and if you want, yes, we are afraid. And fear is a very good advisor. To be fearful or, or careful or in front of danger is, is a sign of wisdom. To be bold and, and superficial in front of, of danger is a sign of, of superficiality and is a sign of, of, um, uh, of uh, sort of, yeah. I'm trying to find something which may not sound too harsh. Uh, yeah, superficial or shallow is, is probably a good word. So Italian did, did well. And I wrote the book. And I, the book is concentrates on 50 reasons to be Italians. These are, are our strong points, 50 reasons. Uh, I know you've all received our attendees my, the 50 reasons to be Italians, you receive them, you can, I can read them to you, but, and we'll talk about it. And they not only deal with the coronavirus or the crisis, the pandemic or the health situation or politics, they go from, you know, from food, our town, our families, our relations, our school, our nurseries, our Montessori school. And those are the 50 pillars. Pillar, yes, that's a good word. 50 pillars where Italy is built and they are solid pillars. And so in a time like this, I think it's important if we concentrate on those to say, okay, those 50 things, we are good at that. We're strong, we're solid. And then if we work on those, we can also tackle and improve and tackle our shortcomings because we're not perfect. I don't know of a single nation which is perfect, thanks God. A, a perfect nation is, must be incredibly boring, by the way. Anyway, this is my introduction. So sorry, Tony, for keep you waiting and uh, welcome. And so first, let me start bluntly. Uh, is, it, is it 
easy to translate my Italian, to translate Beppe Severini, i.e. me. Don't flatter me. Tell me, you know, you, I know you, you like my writing, but just tell me honestly if my, the structure of my Italian. This is the, language, the Italian language week, so it's good to start with language. Please. Well, it's a complicated question, and translation is a complicated thing. Um, first off, I'm keenly aware uh, that I follow in the footsteps of Giles Watson, and in a way, and I think he was a great translator, and I think you should be honored that you keep company with the White Wines of Trieste as one of his, uh, his uh, pieces of work. Um, and in a way, it's, it's not unlike uh, actors that sometimes in a show, a certain character, Sherlock Holmes, is played by one actor and then is played by another actor. Because there's a strong element of theater to the act of translation. Um, an old, no longer with us friend of mine, William Weaver, uh, told the story in the Paris Review of how when they asked him at uh, Bard, what other departments, your class is going to be translation, translation theory, what other department could we put next to um, the entry in the catalog so that students in that, in that discipline might also take the course? And he said, well, theater, theatrical studies. And it makes perfect sense. Um, my daughter, Arlie, when she was young, three or four years old, asked us in a, uh, when, after watching a movie, who bead that person? And we were like, what do you mean, who bead them? And she was clearly saying, who played them? And in a way, what I do when I translate Beppe Severnini is I try to be Beppe Severnini. And it's a lot of fun. The structure of the language is one thing. The structure of the thought is also very important. Because a good translation often leaves parts of the structure behind and brings out the concepts and intentions that the writer might have had. But I'm not really translating Beppe Severnini, I'm translating Beppe Severnini's words. And so when, for instance, in the book I translated before, when you're in a train going across Australia and you get off in small towns, I get a very clear sense of what you saw and what you did from the words, not from you. You never told me about it. And then what you try to do is kind of reproduce it it's as if you take a theatrical production that was put on in New York and then you put it on in another theater that has a different geography, a different structure, a different acoustics in Paris. And so I will say that I know something about the way you think from translating you, um, from translating your words. And I understand that you're a little bit of a magician, a little bit of a special effects artist, and you like to take words Take the title of this new book, 50 Reasons for Being Italian. It's a very interesting and inviting conversational gambit. And there is always with translating you, and I'm kind of coming to the point, there is a little bit of an echo effect because you are working between cultures and between languages. Sometimes you're writing about Italians for Americans. Sometimes you're writing about Americans for Italians but you straddle the two worlds of translation. And so that is also an interesting effect. What happens when you translate is you study the language, you study the words, you study the structure, you look at the techniques that an author has. And I am very, very interested in the way you kind of shape, you bring the reader into an event and it's done in a certain way with language. And as with jokes, it often works the same way in English. So it is not only challenging, but it is fun to be Beppe Severnini, if only as a translation. Well, you're very kind. Do you, uh, do you have at, you know, at hand, uh, at hand so, uh, the fifth reason to be Italian, my book in Italian? I want to try an experiment. Do you have my book uh, around? I am going to be able to find it in about in a very short minute. Okay, 
you find the book and I'll, uh, I'll keep talking. And you, mean, uh, you mean the entire book or just the no, question? Just, you know, the book, uh, first we show the book. We're talking about the book. I do have the book. I have it right here. Okay. And the, uh, and the, I, I think it'll be nice if, if, uh, if you read the Italian, and I, the reason, the first uh -huh. ten, and you read the Italian and I read the English. Because as, as our uh, now attendees may uh, and, uh, know or understand, uh, not only I speak English, but I write in English. When I write my piece for the New York Times, I write, I write them in English or The Economist when I was working for them. But a book I would never, ever attempt. I don't know why, but I think it's so incestuous almost to translate yourself. A book, a translate, a, a book of mine is like, oh, uh, ghastly. And, and I could never compete with Tony Sugar's soft touch. So if you have the reason, why don't I we do. start? I have it from the, public, from the published book, uh, the PDF that you sent me. Okay. So I will read the first one. We'll okay. do them one at a time. Okay, just the first 10. So you give, is the settimana della lingua italiana. We must bring some Italian into this. Uh, 50 reasons so for being the Italian. First di fila. Yes, but let me first introduce. 50 reasons for being Italian. 50 motivi per essere italiani by Beppe Severnini and Tony Sugar. We in the mm -hmm. reverse role. You go for the Italian. Uno. Perché quando tutti si aspettano che ci agitiamo, restiamo calmi. One. Perché because, siamo calmi. No, no, just oh, the, oh, oh, one at a time, one at a time. One, one, because when everyone expects us to lose our cool, we find our strength. Perché siamo fragili quando pensiamo di essere forti e viceversa. Two, because we are vulnerable when we think we are tough and vice versa. Perché sappiamo essere seri, ma lo ammettiamo malvolentieri. Because we can be serious about things, but we hate to admit it. Questo a proposito, uh, by the way, that's, I should send this one to Boris Johnson about this. <laughs> and President Mattarella would agree with me about that. Okay, let's go on. Just 10. Number four. You go. Perché siamo imprevedibili. Se non, diventi, se non diventiamo inaffidabili. Because we are unpredictable, but not unreliable. Perché siamo capaci di bei gesti. Sui buoni comportamenti stiamo lavorando. Because we make gallant gestures. Good behavior, we're working on that. Perché nel mondo ti guardano, in Italia ti vedono. Because the rest of the world looks at you, Italians see you. I love this one. <laughs> Perché troviamo ero, eroi insospettabili. Because we find unexpected heroes. Perché impariamo, perché impariamo, volenti o nolenti. Because we do learn, one way or another. Perché abbiamo visto quasi tutto e il resto lo immaginiamo. Because we've seen practically everything and the rest we imagine. We'll stop here. Thank you, okay. Tony. Let me ask you a second. Thank you for this. He was not, he was not all prepared or, or, or staged. It's like a improvisazione. Let me ask you a second question. Do you prefer to translate fiction or non-fiction? My non-fiction, I know, is a sort of narrative fiction, but still, it's non-fiction. What what is easier to translate, and it, I'm talking about Italian, and second, what, if you given the choice, what makes you happier? It depends. Um, the last book that we worked on together was a book about train travel. So there's a metaphor I like to use for translation, which is that a translation is like being in a compartment of a train for a very, very long train journey with another person. And you hope that they're an interesting conversationalist. You hope that they have interesting ideas. And really, it's not so much a division between fiction and nonfiction. It's a division between spending a long time in somebody's interesting mind or somebody's less interesting mind. I think that you have a very interesting mind. I think you're an observer of the world. 
And so you're also an interesting window through which to see many, many things. Um, when it comes down to it though, translation is really a form of channeling. It's almost like going into a hypnotic trance um, the uh, Plato, I was a classicist before I was a, an Italianist, and Plato talks about the daimon, which is sort of the spirit that takes the, takes the writer, takes the, the orator. And in translation, you're allowing yourself to be sort of filled by another text. And there, it's the language, it's the fun of the language. So in a way, it's not even so much fiction, nonfiction, tragedy, comedy, lighthearted, dire. Um, there is really just transforming one language into another. And there's, there's, a, there's a quality that each language has. Now, both of them are doing the same thing. You know, both of them are expressing just the same ideas, emotions, characters, personas. But English has a strange non-analytical structure. It's like a big jellyfish that's constantly taking words and putting them together and kind of oozing forward, moving with flow, moving with riff. And that's just what English is like. And Italian, uh, no offense, but it's more like a marionette that people are taking and pulling the strings of, or it's a, it's a deeply architectural language. It's a deeply, deeply artisanal language. And in a way, it's like a giant castle, a beautiful enchanted castle of meaning. And so when you're going from one language to another, you're constantly dealing with specifics. So the old story about the fox and the hedgehog, the fox knows lots of little things and the hedgehog knows one big thing. The translator is a little bit of a fox dealing with problem after problem after problem of how to come from this one oozing world into this other, you know, architectural world or vice versa. So I would say that um, that all said, fiction is a little more fun. Well, that is uh, you, our, you all heard a brilliant answer to a predictable question. So thank you, Tony. And Valeria, please write it down. I did a beautiful enchanted castle of meaning. It's yes. a great definition of the Italian language. I'm really, um, I think we'll remember that. Tony, uh, stay there. Feel free to step in. I will ask you a few more questions, a couple of more things, but feel free just to speak up if you want. But now we have our q and I'm delighted to see that in our q and a section of our webinar, we have a few uh, questions already. So I think it's, um, it's only right to give the floor in this way. So I will read out the, the name and, and the questions apart from Roberto Croci, which says salve a tutti in Italian. Let me read Laura Collura. Uh, she says, ciao Beppe, not to question your optimism about Italian, I love it, but I have observed with horror lately that the conspiracy theories and anti-maskers are gaining traction in Italy and almost as much as here in America. I live in LA. Would you, what would you make of that? Laura, uh, you're talking about a tiny minority in Italy, but really a tiny minority. A few, a couple of silly MPs, a few inter exhibitionists, you know, who think they are this, but you're talking very few people. In Italian, we say quattro gatti. Quattro gatti, four cats. You don't say that in English. How do you say quattro gatti, Tony? Uh, a motley crew. Okay. In Italian, it's lovely. Quattro gatti means very few people, which in fact is not a is not a very good definition because cats are intelligent beings. Those people are less intelligent. But you're talking about what? Two thousand people in Berlin. There were thirty, forty thousand people. I'm afraid in America, I've seen people in their thousands carrying weapons protesting against the mask. These people do not represent anything in Italy. And uh, it's not true that they carry, you know, we are journalists. It's not our fault, but that's the way we proceed. We, you know, we see these people, 
with this, um, how do you say, Giubetti Catari Frangenti? Help me out, Tony. Uh, these safety have the orange vests? vests. Eh? Safety orange vests? Yeah, the orange vests from the car. They, yep. they, they wear them, they go out in the square, and they think they're really cool. They're ridiculous. And most Italians know they are ridiculous, and they don't count. And they have poor color choice, so the Italians, I think, would particularly... A few days ago on television, I say, what I really care is bring them those vests back to your cars, because they are useful there. Be serious, at least here. Uh, no, so, Laura, don't worry. They don't count. And we see, you know, the other day, like 40, 24 hours ago, 48 hours ago, in Liverpool, UK, a very civilized country, despite this very poor uh, decision, judgment and decision to leave the EU, but it's a great country, a great town. Actually, my, my very, in 2020, my, my last foreign trip was to Liverpool. And in Liverpool, you had, you know, everybody was out in the street wearing no mask and celebrating and sort of challenging the... the... In Italy, you haven't seen anything like that. Would you consider that? And are we supposed to be, un to be the anarchic, the, the unruly ones? Wow. Uh, Elisabetta Bilardi, how important is to know the writer personally to translate his work perfectly? This is for you, Tony. Mm -hmm. Well, it is interesting to know the writer, but honestly, I don't think that a translator has a much different relationship to the writer than a reader does. One of the things that I would say is that translation is much slower than reading. And in a way, there's, there's a metaphor I like to use for it, but I did not know uh, Pepe and we've gotten to know each other better and that's fine. It makes me happy. I'm happy to be able to ask him questions, but really when it comes to the work of translating him, it's his books. It's not that bad. I can ask him exactly what he meant somewhere, but I haven't needed to do that. And translating is like, if, if reading a book is like driving down a highway in a car, translating is like walking on that highway. And I, when you need to, you get off the highway and walk around behind the trees. There's a whole different interaction with the words. It's a three-dimensional thing. It's hard to describe. But I, I think, Beppe, you and I have not spent, we did, have, we did have some really useful back and forth on the questions. And you were very instrumental. But Beppe is not your typical writer. He's not your typical Italian writer who's like, you're the expert on English. He writes for the, uh, for the Economist, for the Financial Times, for the New York Times in English. So that is not a fair question. Let's just say that. Thank you, um, twice. Thank you for answering my question and thank you for the very flattering and things you said about my writing and me. Um, let's go on. Um, I cannot read them all. They are, they are starting to pile up. Uh, let's say uh, Juliana Palmas as a Sarda. I love reason number 23. Reason number 23 is, uh, uh, let me, because Sardinia smells like patience, is the geographic part of the book because Milan is political and sensual. That's number 20. 21, because Rome is a story to it, all to itself. 22, because our North and our South fight like an old married couple. I love that. Uh, so I was in Sardinia uh, until Monday. And, uh, and yes, Sardinia deserves a lot. Uh, I think Sardinia... Uh, deserves more credit than, and actually more visit. I, I wish everyone, when we are, uh, hope soon, ready to travel again, do go to Sardinia. It's the most fun, amazing jewel uh, in the Mediterranean. I love Sicily as well. I love Corsica and I love, but everyone has got his own, you know, my football team is Inter Milan and my heart goes to Sardinia. It's my favorite part of Sai Lombardy and Trieste. Those are the three areas of Italy where I just find myself, eh, whenever I step, I go to Trieste or I go to Sardinia, I'm happy. Don't ask me why. Uh, Juliana Palmas, again, sorry, 23, she wrote twice. 
Loredana Bignamini. Ciao Beppe. Oh, she said, I'll, I'll translate into English, that she was, she attended the pizzata, the Italian pizza in 2000 in Los Angeles that evening. And she said, we hope this year is going to be better. Uh, Susan Muller. Beppe, what can we Americans learn from the Italians' response to the pandemic? Uh, one thing about America, if I may, and one thing about Italy. First about America, that uh, it's not part of the journalist's job to, to, to praise his government. But I have to be honest, I, and I wrote that in the New York Times, in Corriere della Sera, I repeated that on television. I think during the emergency, the Italian government with a very inexperienced prime minister, because he was, uh, uh, Giuseppe Conte was not, uh, was taken by, like all of us by surprise. And, but it, it was obvious the effort uh, to unite the country, and I think even the opposition, not always up and downs, but you have the feeling that Italy decided to stick together. And that really makes a big difference. When you have a leader who instead of uniting the country and trying to say, okay, it's a tough time, let's stick together. Uh, together we're stronger. Uh, let's try to help each other. In Italy, relations and networks really work and extended family and friends and things. And really, they got they, they were activated almost immediately. And if you have a, a leader that, instead of uniting his nations, try to divide the nations for different reasons, maybe in electoral year, everything becomes more difficult. I have to say that. And uh, the thing about, about Italy, uh, you see, it's... Uh, in Italy, it was not a collective reaction. Germans are very good at collective reaction. It's like opera. They are the, you know, they go like, well, I'm all together. No, in Italy is 60 million sopra 30 million sopranos and 30 million tenors. So everybody is a, is a star. Everybody is he, himself or herself. And that's why it's so difficult to run anything in Italy, let alone the country. But if Italians, Italians want to decide, every single Italian want to decide whether any rule or regulations actually applies to himself or herself at that very moment. But once he or she has decided that really that rule makes sense, we're really good at that. So what we saw this year, and we are still watching, by the way, what we watched, it's not a, a 60 million, uh, sorry, a, a country's reaction. You have a, this amazing spectacle of 60 millions, including children, individual reaction, more or less pushing in the same direction. We decided that after all, locking down in March and April made sense. And once an Italian has decided that the rule makes sense and actually is good for himself or herself, we do stick to the rules. I know it sounds strange, but it works. I actually wanted to throw something in as a non-Italian who has a thousand reasons for being Italian, if I may. There was the, the description that you make of these kind of these rules, these structures that sort of self-propagate. I remember early on in my time in Italy, I, had, I was observing something and trying to figure it out. And it was groups of friends who went to dinner together. And often this is called a giro. And often there's a sort of an informal, well, we get together every third Thursday of every month or every few months we all get together. And in these events, there was something that I observed. I don't know if it's still done, but it was a little bit of grand opera you have a table full of you know 12 people and one person will say no no let me get this i'm paying for this what you don't know is that the next time they get together the person to his left says no no I, i'll get this and then the time after that the woman to their right says and over the course of 20 or 30 years it's as if they'd all split the bill carefully it's a beautiful structure 
uh, informal, friendly, but also a rule that cannot be broken and it works perfectly and it protects the whole. <laughs> I love, I love that. I love that. We have so many questions. I have to rush. Gianni Lovato uh, is the same similar question, similar to Laura. So I just say hi to Gianni Lovato. When we cross America by train, uh, Tony and Sylvia and Valeria, when we and everybody else, when we crossed America from Portland, Maine to Portland, Oregon in 2012, before yet another American election, 2012, with the outcome that you all know. We took a train, took three weeks and more. We did a TV film, we did, uh, and this is actually in my book of the rails. This person, Gianni Lovato from Milan, uh, he, he actually boarded the train uh, with a flag and bringing a Peri TV. And, uh, and then the Amtrak, the Amtrak uh, conductor came over very serious, say, I'm sorry, you cannot drink or food, uh, drink, uh, cannot have drinks or food brought from outside on the train. I'm sorry. And we were all sipping our Peri TV with this. Gianni Lovato came on the train with his Italian flag in upstate New York. And, uh, and I looked at him and I say, but we are Italians. And he considered that a very good explanation. And he left. I love that. Do you remember that? Gianni, how wonderful you are. Of were. course. Uh, let's go on. Uh, Diana Baldanti. Thank you, thank you, Gianni Lovato, for your kind words. Diana Baldanzi, numero 18. Uh, she can see the definition all in English. She wants number 18 reasons to be Italian. The number 18 she wants in Italian. In English is uh, because we can have fun without getting filthy drunk. And, and in Italian, Italian perché ci divertiamo senza essere sbronzi. Che è importante. Eh, Alessandra Milan. Hello everyone, let's focus on point number five because of the rest of the world looks at you, Italian see you. What do you mean exactly, Beppe? Uh, I tell you what I mean. Uh, this is it's something that happened in Scotland years ago during a, I was actually my book tour for La Bella Figura I was in St. Andrews University and a, very, and a young lady um, a very attractive young lady stood up and out of the blue she said I'm gonna marry an Italian and I looked at her and say I see no problem I guess you have about 30 million to choose from just inform the wife just in case and she ignored my remark something in America you could never do, but in Italy, and an Italian can get away with everything on this. And, and she was actually, she was so serious and she was very nice. And she said, you know why I'm saying this? Because I am from South Africa. I lived in Israel, I lived in Germany, I lived in France, and I now live in Britain and I lived in Italy. And in the world, everywhere, they look at you. In, Ita in Italy, they see you. And I knew exactly what she meant. That in Italy, you're never a number. You are a person. It doesn't mean you are a hero, but look at the relation between the police and the public in Italy. It's, we have our problems. Of course, we had our problems. We have unpleasant situations and so on. But on the whole, the majority, you know, you're stopped by the police or by the carabinieri, and it's like two human beings talking to each other. There is no fear, no aggression, no nothing, no numbers, give me your numbers. And, and you have these two people, because the carabinieri see you as a human being, and actually is actually quite good at reading through you. And you see another Italian, and you try to discuss. Sometimes you pretend you are not, uh, you are not uh, sort of speeding with your car. In fact, you were. But it goes from, you know, personal relation, the relation of the police, the relation, Italians see you. That's why many foreigners love being in Italy. I know there are many Americans listening to us, and I notice so many American friends, British friends, German friends, foreign friends, they come to Italy and they tell me, you think we are here because of Tuscany and the arts and the uh, Venice and the beauty and the food and the wine and ba ba bam. Actually, the thing that the most attractive things about Italy is that we feel like human beings. People see you. People acknowledge you. 
that's so important and that's something we do very well sometimes even too well uh, let's go on if i may comment the one one thing that i've noticed is that italians will make observations about you which aren't always hey you're looking great sometimes i say you look tired are you all right they actually do it's not just boilerplate you're fine they 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 see you and they react yeah and and that's another one another point actually bring one of the 50 reason is a very sensitive point but i like to bring this up just now is is uh let's see if i find it uh, it's the relation between men and women that is one specific point maybe tony you can help me to find I'm looking fast see what i can do and uh, and this again we're not perfect far from it but relations are easier you can actually do you hear tony's comment you can comment on on people how they look you can say to someone oh you look great uh, even to a colleague you know say Italians know the boundary between kindness and something else. Sometimes they, some people, men, decide to ignore that boundary, and that's wrong. But people know that boundary, and Italian women know that very well too. And that's tell me, uh, believe me, in this particular this, area. Uh, did you mean? Perché conosciamo il confine tra gentilezza e molestia, 28? Yes, let's read it in and English. That would be... Because we know the line that separates the cortus from the intrusive. It's important. Okay, let's... I, we have so many comments. Thank you. Valeria, congratulations. It's great success looking at the numbers of, of comments we have. Most of them are really good. We have not time for all. Uh, uh, let's say, let's pick uh, Emanuela Appetiti. Beppe, can you describe the concept of la bella figura for Italians? After 20 years in the US, I still have problems in explaining it. Wow. <laughs> uh, let's put it, it's the title of my book, you can see behind me, La Bella Figura, uh, the book 15 years ago. La bella figura is an aesthetic concept. It's not a good behavior, it's something else. There is a theatrical element in Italian life, which doesn't mean that the being good is not important. But la bella figura is like you, you watch yourself doing something nice and you actually, you are at the same time, you are the actor and you are the audience. And that's La Bella Figura. You really appreciate yourself and you like, there is a kind of aesthetic beauty in what you do. It's not only leaving a good impression. That's not a good translator, translation. Let's ask Tony, if you find La Bella Figura, how do you translate that? Giovanni voleva fare Bella Figura. I think your theatrical description is, is very good. Figura can mean face and putting a good face on things, but it is exactly what you say, almost a stepping outside of yourself and taking pleasure in your own performance. And not just in a theatrical way, but in a real world way, taking pleasure in being the good guy in a certain, or the good gal in a certain situation, of being someone who comes across, so it's a moral, aesthetic and ethical concept. Yeah. It's like you, in that particular moment, you watch yourself from outside, you watch yourself and it's like you, you acted very well in that little frame of the film of your life. I like that. Uh, a beautiful moment in uh, La Strada when uh, Anthony Quinn, as Zampano says, he's, he's buying um uh, uh, what was her name uh, the 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 character anyway he's he's buying these kids sisters and he throws them some candy and they say oh grazie grazie and he says eh, son fatto così 
So even he, the most abject character in all of Fellini's films, he had that moment of like bella figura. Absolutely. Let's go on. Uh, Giovanni Hopkins, saluti da Chicago, ma di Pesaro. Uh, and uh, it's an interesting one. Claudia Cali, do these 50 reasons for being Italians are also, uh, is wrong, uh, do, these, uh, do these 50 reasons for being Italian apply to, uh, uh, apply to us, Italians living abroad? Claudia, absolutely yes, even more so. There is, there is one, uh, one of the reasons, actually more than one is, is about you. And I tell you one that I really like. Let's see if I find it. Uh, in number 38, because in every lab on earth, there is a computer, a green plant, and an Italian. Silvia, how do you like that? It's true. In California, I've seen Italians everywhere, in the Silicon Valley, in LA, in university, all over California and elsewhere. So absolutely, yes. Let's go on. Uh, uh, pa -pa -pa Alessandra Bonatti, Beppe, you should praise our government. You prove every point in your book. Humanity prevailed over concern over economics. But Boris, to Boris Johnson, I replied, Italians care about Italians. Bravissimo, grazie. Thank you, Alessandra. Let's say that I, I'm a journalist, so I'm entitled to do this. Uh, although this is Italian Institute of Culture, they invite me. You know, I try, I try and I, I'm, uh, it's part of my job, uh, of my sort of job description, to be frank. And our government has to be very careful now. We need details, we need precision, we need instruction. Italians need guidance. Italians are ready to follow guidelines, but they need those guidelines. Some, some things about uh, the flu vaccines, which is hard to find, and other things, uh, precision is important. The heart is at the right place, but precision is important. Let's see if we have a few more minutes. There are so many of those. Andrea Perugini. Hello, everyone. Beppe, in your experience, which cultural aspects of Italy are difficult to understand to America and vice versa? Well, that's too broad. Uh, Italians sometimes fail to understand the, the, this amazing uh, American uh, sort of gift for bouncing back. And I hope we'll see again very soon American bouncing back. I'm a great fan of America. And they, they see Americans have the, the, can taste the future. Uh, it's something that it, sometimes in Italy we fail to do. You can see how everyone, families and people, they have this thing about the future. The future is sexy, is tasty and everything. That's something Italians sometimes miss about America. What Americans sometimes miss about Italy, that, uh, that yeah, sometimes uh, there is a, a theatrical aspect to Italy. They sometimes take things too literally. And in Italy, Italy needs to be translated. And you don't have always Tony Sugar walking alongside you to explain everything that happens. People sometimes, I realize, even my colleagues tend to take things too literally. Uh, and also stereotypes are, about Italy are very, very uh, sort of obvious. And every country in the world suffers of stereotypes. But in Italy, they tend to be sometimes exaggerated. And in fact, if you use stereotypes, you came up with sort of silly, oh, Italy will never be able to, be, to cope with coronavirus. Italy will sort of melt. Actually, we didn't. And we don't. Maybe I, and we won't. Yeah, I may kind of just there's one, one question in there that I'd like to partly respond to and ask you to respond to. So it's from Jenny Nevoso. And the, may I? Yes, go ahead. A question for Mr. Sugar. I was tra trained as a translator and I am on a constant journey through words, meanings and their magic. Do you agree with Umberto Eco when he stated that, it, quote, translation is a compromise, unquote. Thank you for all you do. 
convey Mr. Severnini's writing. And I wanted to answer this with this observation. There's a beautiful um, op-ed piece that Michael Cunningham wrote in the New York Times about translation. And he says that he's very indulgent with his translators if they want to change things. And he says one of the reasons that he is so understanding of translators is that as a writer, the book that he wrote is never quite the book that he hoped to write. He said he conceived a cathedral of fire in his mind, and that was the novel. And when he wrote it, it was a perfectly fine book, but it wasn't the cathedral made of fire that he originally conceived. And so all translations are, after all, just a translation of something that was a translation and maybe not a perfect one. How do you feel as a writer? When you're, you are your own translator, you conceive something and then you put it into words. And sometimes those words don't live up to the original idea. Are you ever frustrated? Is it, I mean, it's a lot of fun, but do you, you know, what are you trying to do that you sometimes feel you fall short on? No, to be honest, it's something, I think it's the greatest joy of a writer. And I think I'm lucky on, the, sometimes I have, when I write something down, it comes out more clearly than in my mind. It's like, uh, it's, uh, it's, I never, I don't know the feeling, of, oh, it's so clear in my mind, but when I write it down, it's not so effective or clear or convincing. It's exactly the other way around. When I read what I wrote and I say, who wrote that? Who's moving my hind? Who's behind my shoulder? I don't see this person writing and putting th things in words. So it, it's, it's a great hard. thing. Both that's a wonderful thing. In English. Yeah, no, that's a wonderful thing. And Sartre actually said that is when you don't recognize the words that you wrote, that, that means something, you've created something. Good. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll go and get, uh, if you give me one second before I, uh, we say goodbye, because Valeria, uh, are you there? And uh, am I right that it's about time to go? Uh, almost, but I would suggest I was reading the chat. So if you don't mind me stepping in. One final question uh, was Giovanna Hopkins, I think. And she asked, why did you want to write this book right now? I mean, in this very special time of pandemics in Italy. Okay. Do you want to answer that? Yes, I will. Uh, but... Uh, uh, I'll have I need time to go and get a copy of the book, which uh, to okay. answer another question. Of course, take, take your time. Ten seconds. Take your time. Sure. That's the book, Neo Italiani, and the, and the reasons are in here because uh, you see one to twenty five, and the end of the book is twenty six to fifty. And because someone asked me if it's possible to have the 50 reasons in Italian, I'll, I'll send them to Valeria and we'll make sure, sure that they are available both in Italian, in English, in your, on your website or wherever you want. I'm happy to do that. Yes, yes, thank you so much. And of course, because it's the week of the Italian language, so it would be great also to share them with our guests, uh, today's guests in Italian as well. So we send you for sure uh, the 50 reasons in Italian and in English. Uh, the question, am I, do I remember well why I wrote the book? Yeah, it's Giovanna Hopkins. Severnini, perché hai voluto scrivere questo libro in questo momento storico di pandemia? Because I was surprised by the reaction of my own country. Uh, I, uh, I'm a journalist, I'm not... Uh, it's not part of my job to praise my country. I don't believe in my country, right or wrong. I believe that if it's wrong, as a journalist, you could say so, if you think it's wrong. And, but this time, I think we did most things right. And, uh, and it was a, I lived in Italy, my old crema, which is very much present in the book. And I think an Italian small town has got... It's got so much going for it, and it's such a, a great structure to tackle, even socially. When um, people help each other, no one in Crema, believe me, was left on his own, and it was tough here. 
We had a field hospital built by, by the Italian army in three days uh, with 30 beds. And we have 50 doctors from Cuba coming to help. So we're talking a tough time. And I decided that it, in a way, I wanted to be Um, come si può dire? Aiutami tu. Era come se avesse bisogno forse di, di qualche carezza e di fare qualche carezza al mio paese in un momento così difficile. The town needed a pat on the back. It needed to have its head patted. It needed to have a few exchanges of kindness. Yes. Uh, even journalists, believe me, believe it or not, can do that. Uh, Valeria, is she back? Uh, uh, yes, I am. Sorry, we have, we're having some experiences, some internet connection troubles today. So that's why I'm moving in and back and forth. Um, so before maybe say, I don't know, maybe we have time for another question, if you like, but if you have time. Go or, ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Or maybe I will ask. Oh, okay. Go ahead. Can I step in for a moment because I've seen sure. uh, a few questions um, uh, uh, of the public that I'd like to take because some uh, of our of our guests asked um, that they're probably struggling to uh, keep uh, a high interest in the um, in the or learning of Italian, of our language. So they ask, and I want to, to make this question mine because we are we also work for you know, keeping this interest alive. Beppe, what do you think can be done to, since there's a lot of interest for Italian culture, to keep high the interest of the youngest to learn Italian language? And that's appropriate also because it's a week of the Italian, uh, the, the World Week of the Italian Language. Thank you. Uh, Italy and the Italian, as you, we, all, we all know, we all know everybody attending today's uh, sort of lovely meeting knows that Italy and the Italian is associated to the nice things of life about with food and music and wine and relation between people and the arts and the and the landscape and the sea and all, all that and I think it's um, is obviously is what we Italians and the Italian history of culture have tried to build on uh, but I think it's um, the real strength of Italy is the Italians. I, I do believe that in a way connecting and creating connection maybe with Italian schools. I did so. I remember I, I was instrumental to creating a exchange with MIT for a few years and they came to teach in Italy. And, and I think even for students of Italian, if Italy is there, across the sea with all this problem in Italy and Europe and uh, forget the pandemic in, in regular times. And America is there with all this thing and, and, uh, and now the election and Trump and Biden and that and that in the China. It's, it, you need something to bring people together and to, you, to bring people together, you need people. So I think that if you, as many relation between like schools uh it's 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 crucial schools or people or association there are so many people who love things american and love the idea of being associated now we have tools like look what we're doing now we have tools that were unthinkable just a couple of years ago so now a group of Italians studying English and a group of Americans studying Italian, they could actually meet every week and talk and know each other and maybe once, and I think that's a trick. We all think of learning a language and everything else with sort of yesterday's mind. We all, everyone, not you of course, including me. And I think it's time to use all these things. Italians are people. And people are our greatest strength. And people come across a, like, a, like a, an event like today and many very powerfully. So 
I noticed in China, for instance, that whenever they had the chance in Hong Kong, they study Italian, whenever they had the chance to, to deal with Italy, touch Italy, sort of smell Italy, have to deal with anything Italian personally with someone called Anna or Marco or Stefano or Anna or Luisa, it, it, everything changes. And, and so I would try to create those connections. Uh, otherwise, it's, it's going to be difficult because everybody has got his own problems. Italy is, uh, Italy is, uh, can be reassuring. And I think everyone in the world nowadays needs the reassurance. And maybe on this, I hope it's a nice note to end our chat. Very, very nice. Thank you, Beppe. Thank you for everything. Uh, so... Uh, unfortunately, we have to um, wrap up. So, grazie Beppe, grazie Tony, grazie alla nostra console generale Silvia Chiave, and thank you all of you for tuning in from all over. We were looking at your questions here, literally from all over, and uh, for tuning in with the Italian Culture Institute of Los Angeles. So, please stay tuned in on our media for our coming events and especially the ones for the Settimana della Lingua Italiana, la ventesima edizione, la lingua italiana nel mondo. On October 19th, we will host a virtual tour of the exhibit Drawing Stories, The Evolution of the Italian Language in Comics, organized with Romics and Institutes throughout the US, with uh, live streaming presentations on October the 21st, 23rd, and 28th, featuring major names in Italian comics. The Institute will also present with the Consulate General of Houston, the journalist and writer Federico Rampini, in a virtual encounter, East and West, 2,500 years of history getting to know each other, and we succeeded on October the 23rd. And last but not least, uh, was about the theme, which this year is Italian comics. Uh, on October the 27th, the Institute in Los Angeles will host a presentation on the history of Italian comics by Antonio Iannotta of the University of San Diego. So, thank you all, grazie a tutti, grazie ancora Beppe, Tony, Console Generale, grazie. Have a wonderful rest of the day for those of you who are here on Pacific time. And a very good evening for those of you who are somewhere else in Italy. And uh, stay tuned and Buona settimana della lingua italiana nel mondo. Grazie.